Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, welcome to the fifth episode at this point. The fifth, yes, I'm very proud. <laughs> the fifth episode of Olava Talks. Um, I always start off with a little explanation of what the Olava Talks are. Uh, Olava Talks are uh, a series of conversations I am uh, producing, hosting, uh, with amazing people that I meet in my everyday work and life and activism and politics. Um, I started this project because I noticed at some point that um, I was having these amazing conversations and I was learning so much in, in, during those conversations with these encounters and people and, and I found myself really sort of reappreciating, reevaluating the importance and the, and, the, and the effectiveness of conversations as a tool of knowledge production, but also as a tool for knowledge transfer. And I would come home and I would be like, oh my God, you know, and like, but at the same time feel like there was no archive of these moments, of these encounters. And I thought, and I think you will, you will, you will get the, the need for that. I thought mm -hmm. it's necessary to really sort of archive this work and these encounters and these, 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 these conversations and the knowledge produced there mm -hmm. um, and archive it. And then the one way I thought of doing that was through uh, a vodcast. And I've chosen for the vodcast um, uh, 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 platform me method because with vodcast, I can put it on YouTube and mm -hmm. put a, 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 a captioning. So, oh, nice. yes, so that it becomes also accessible for people who can't hear mm. um, us. And I think that that's something which, you know, I mean, it's a bit of, you can't really have with, with, with podcasts mm -hmm. because they're strictly audio. Mm -hmm. So hence the podcasting. Yeah. And because I think uh, queer people and people of color and all these amazing people I meet are fabulous. So mm -hmm. they need to be seen. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's Olava Talks and why I'm doing Olava Talks and why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. Um, Today, I've invited uh, Simona Zafek. I'll get to you. Uh, first. <laughs> wait. But first, I want to talk yes. about this spread. Um, I'm hoping that with the Olava podcast, I will be able to like sort of have like food at every episode. So let's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> this very first one with food, we're doing it. Uh, this was catered by Heavenly Cupcakes in Rotterdam. Shameless. Shameless plug right there. Right, so <laughs> Get there and you will be in a bit of That's what you need to do. And I need to tell you a little bit about, not necessarily just about Heavenly Cupcakes, which is delicious food, very affordable, artisanal, amazing stuff, really creative, as you can tell, and entirely plant based, vegan 100%. I also want to talk about the woman who started, who does Heavenly Cupcakes. Um, uh, Jessica started Heavenly Cupcakes about four or five years ago, I believe, <laughs> mostly from her kitchen. Mm. Yes, and mostly with cakes and cupcakes, and they became a big thing. And eventually, she moved into like her own bakery mm. space, and it's really cute. And I just have to say, like, she's one of those people that you meet. I met her, I believe, if I remember correctly, I met her one time mm. uh, while I was I had just become vegan and it was all new to me. And I went mm. to her place and I said hello. I need to, you know. And the next time I spoke to her, I had been. Uh, committed into mm. a psychiatric uh, uh, clinic mm. and the psychiatric clinic I was committed there involuntarily for unbeknownst amount of mm. time they had no vegan food no vegan options for me either and um, I called her and I asked her whether she would be willing to deliver to my psychiatric mm. clinic and I asked her, how much money can I pay you and everything and for like almost seven months this person made sure that every week um, she would get these huge packages and I was, she was giving me way more food than I was paying for. <laughs> way more food than I was paying for. Uh, for the seven months that I was there, she single-handedly made sure that I was fed, that I was healthy, and uh, she was cooking at home for me, like outside of her menu. Um, it was... Exactly. And, and she's become one of my best friends and um, such an Im intense amount of caring and love. So... The food is amazing. Uh, Heavenly Cupcakes is super cute, but the person behind it is a treasure that I think in, in the various communities, vegan communities as well, mm -hmm. I think we need to uh, definitely do honor and cherish her. But anyway. Let's all go there. Huh? Let's all go there. Let's all go there. Exactly. <laughs> That's Jessica Sterler, Heavenly Cupcakes. Yes. You can definitely dig in, by the way. <laughs> I will. This is the high tea that she does. 
Exactly. So it's gonna be a... uh, sweet and savory. Simona Zafak. I invited Simona. I'm... Okay, so how do I know Simona Zafak? Simona Zafak, I met uh, through a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. And, and I then saw her a number of times at uh, lectures that she gave and other events, live streamed and, and otherwise, uh, including one really amazing dinner where we were, where we were celebrating uh, black women activists in the Netherlands a couple of years back at Christmas. It was really amazing. And, um, and Simone de Zeyfak is one of those people who, and you can check out her blog, which I think is also an archive of these moments, of what's happening today in our day and age, right? And I think it's a really great way to find out what's going on. Uh, I, I then read one of her pieces, and it was about an, an undocumented uh, uh, person who had been deported. And uh, I was struck and moved and uh, inspired, but in a very material sense, like, go do something. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because of just not only the very strong political and theoretical uh, and legal insight that you have, but the, the, the humanity, the empathy, mm -hmm. the real solidarity work. And I've okay. seen you do, you know, all that work. So I thought, and you did also decolonize the museum. Together with all the homies. All the homies. Dear Shafok, Uno yeah. Masam, and a group of... You don't gotta invite them all, right? No, you should. I think we were like 40 people. Oh, really? In total, yeah. So we got 40 episodes of right under there. 40, really. 40 orders of amazing cake and yes. sandwiches, yes. yes. Well, well, I'm gonna try to change up the menu. Sorry. I'm gonna do one Burundian one sometime. Okay, cool. That, that? that was the last time What's you were that? supposed to come here. That? that was supposed to do brilliant. Listen, uh, you when somebody show. tried to broke into my car uh -huh. and my tire was flat. Oh. So yeah, you know. Okay, you got me back right there. No, it's fine. Right. Here, have a cake. Thank you so much. <laughs> Olaf is as sweet as these cakes. <laughs> you start off with <laughs> Anyway, so uh, that's why I invited you because I think you're amazing Thank and you so I want to hear about all of it all. Where do we start? I want to start, where do you want to start? Where do you want to start? Where do I want to start? I want to start with um, Black Panther Unpacked, which we did uh, last weekend. When you I, gave the amazing breakdown. Did I? Your, you did. your breakdown, though, I was sitting there, I was like, this is professional shit. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you do, do, how do you practice your breakdowns? Do you do down workshops? I'm just a nerd. Okay. <laughs> tell us, so tell us about, like, nerd. your breakdown, uh, the event and what it because I think it's in part of a larger series. Yeah, we're gonna do a series of breakdowns and okay. it's gonna be a series for nerd folk. Okay. People who just wanna unpack something till okay. there's nothing left to, okay. to unpack. Okay. People who just wanna talk about Black Panther after they've seen it twenty times and they still wanna talk about it for five hours. <laughs> if you're that person then the movie is for you. Oh the event is for you. So it's gonna be a series and we talk about Black Panther and you made me change my mind. About your cousin, Rocky, <laughs> who I did not like, but instead the brother. And you gave a proper breakdown. Did I? You gave a really good breakdown. I tried. I tried. You did. Because I did a number of drafts mm -hmm. of it, and then and I this was, was like. really good. Huh? You, yours is really, really good. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I did a number of drafts, and I was very much like nervous because I felt like I've never done this kind of criticism, this mm. kind of review, because it's a. It's a Movie criticism, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and I wanted to do something that was different than what everybody has talked about already, mm -hmm. and I, I I hadn't heard anyone talk about the Daniel character, which For I think reasons. is a very fascinating mm -hmm. character. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Obviously, I didn't before your talk. I did not. No, it was fascinating <laughs> at all. <laughs> but after your talk, I'm like, you're right. You're right. Yeah, it's fascinating. But you didn't talk about. Nobody talked about Kill about uh, Killmonger. We didn't really get into Killmonger, and I feel like... True. Um, there's feelings there. Talk, yes, I only want to talk about Killmonger and his museum scene. Because um, no. I think Killmonger is highly problematic. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not a super big superhero fan, okay. so I might be overlooking characters that are the same. But I feel that... Um, I don't know. Not just current conversations, but the idea of a black man doing something and being instantly forgiven mm. because he always also did something cool. Mm -hmm. And we can take it to be it a Kanye West or an R. Kelly. I guess for you had this one scene, not to say that Killmonger said, but you know what I mean. So he has this one scene where he is um, with like the hardship herbs and this older woman, this older sister is planting the herbs. Mm -hmm. And he says, I just want to take it and burn it all. 
And she then tries to go back to planting and he grabs her mm. and he lifts her up by her throat. Yeah. And then it starts burning every day and he's smacking around the women. And I felt like, and then when I see people say, oh, Killmonger is so fine. I'm like, but yeah. no. Yeah. No, like I appreciated the one scene in the beginning and after that when he fell off, I'm like, no, this is not a character I would like to, because we cannot talk about him and then ignore how violent he was. Yeah. Towards um, the women who were doing what they were doing in with, with yeah. flowers, the women who were fighting. And also his, his girlfriend that he kills. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm 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 not a Killmonger fan at all. Yeah. No. And if you say Michael B. Jordan is hot, um, then maybe. But <laughs> you're like, you but that, Killmonger. But Killmonger, no. Uh, no, but I think you know, like sort of the hotness of people like. Michael B. Jordan and mm. everything. I, I'm getting to a point in my life where it doesn't really excite me anymore. It doesn't interest because it's so. I'm sorry, he's a very attractive it's man, but it's so though. much conventional attraction. True, yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, a muscular man. Okay, you know, we get it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, with like very refined features. Sure. You know, I'm not. Listen, if he's not in Jobu, I'm, I'm not, I don't care. Wait, <laughs> who cares? I'm like, first Sterling K. Brown, and the rest is all. Anyways, like, but I do, I do have to say that one of the things that was also really heartbreaking to me on the Killmonger scene is the violence indeed towards his girlfriend, yeah. and also the sort of like these this, this tattoos that he has on his body, these mm-hmm. markings. The scars, yeah. The scars, and then he puts them in the context of having killed, he, he marked himself, Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 with, within these traditional patterns mm-hmm. I don't know exactly from which uh, uh, culture, communities that comes from but traditions that comes from but I'm pretty sure that that's not sort of that, mm-hmm. that legacy of what that's about mm-hmm. and for him to say and I killed other brothers other black people to get to this point mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In that, that instrumentalization of black pain and death and, and it just to me you know it really doesn't um I remember that that's one of the first moments I started crying in the movie. Like, I mm. cried a bunch of times mm. in the movie because, you know, I feel um, my you feelings are lot. <laughs> uh, and because that was shocking to me. It was, it was, it was such a, it was such a, um, you know, like I don't, this idea of black people being killed uh, uh, for ideological purposes and so on. It just, I don't want to watch it. I don't want to hear about it. You know, and, a little bit with the whole situation with Childress Gambino now, with the with This Is America as well. Mm-hmm. Like, tell me how you feel about the video clip. How do I feel about the video clip? Mm-hmm. Is that like an entire? That's an entire Olava talks. Yeah, <laughs> I think that uh, especially with Atlanta, for example, mm-hmm. like with the with the show, I think that one thing became clear to me uh, when watching Atlanta. Childish Gambino, uh, Donald Glover made something that was for black people. Mm-hmm. And I think he's very capable of that. And I think some yeah. of these sort of allegations that he's, the allegations, but these sort of uh, 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 suggestions that he made this video for white America, mm-hmm. I'm not sure whether I agree. Because mm-hmm. I think he's had indeed sort of like a learning curve and that maybe he's more interested in talking to other black people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so when I think about it that way, then I think he might be saying, I don't know it because that's another thing about art. Huh? You make something and then the audience does with yeah, it true. whatever they want. So I'm not claiming sort of that I know what his agency mm-hmm. is. I'm do- to me, it seems that if it's sort of a conversation he's trying to have with other celebrities, he's saying, you know, we are complicit. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, which I can get. And I can get uh, because he also centers himself. He's not having other black people shoot each other he, or other artists, mm-hmm. but he's the one with the, with the gun in the hand and yeah. so on. And 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 aside from the fact that I'm not interested in seeing black death anymore, I really am not. Yeah. You know, um, I also don't think it's necessarily fair towards other uh, uh, creators and makers, uh, uh, black creators mm. and makers and artists. And so on. I don't think it's really fair to say you're complicit because you make this sort of uh, uh, this art that people mm. love and watch that is distracting. Because I think a lot of the the, the art that is, we're seeing in this last mm. five years, three years, is very political, it is. is very subversive, mm. and I think, um, I don't know, I, 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 I was a little bit conflicted by that saying, if you're saying to other makers and saying, look at you, we're coo-, you know, it's a kind of an elaborate kind of way of saying we're all cooning and mm. sort of complicit in the system, um, I don't think that's really fair, especially if I see the work that Solange has done, for mm-hmm. example. That's a, that's a that's an album in heels, yeah. you yeah, know, yeah, that we yeah, need. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. When I see the sort of 
as problematic as Beyonce is. But so the, uh, the evolution she's is gone through, the celebration Beyonce. of blackness at Beachella, for example, at uh, Coachella. <laughs> but basically, it's the same. It's it's the same. Doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it, it, it's something which I think. Um, anyways, but that's me. What do you think? Uh, Donald Glover. I think I love him, but I'm not sure. Mm. Um, there's something in Atlanta that shows us he's genius, mm. but it's still not for me. Mm. Atlanta, you had a few episodes of Atlanta. Um, I forgot the name of the episode, but he's in this house with somebody. He's trying to buy a piano. Mm-hmm. And you have this man who, I think he bleached his skin or something. Mm-hmm. Watch that episode, fell in the middle of it. I thought, oh, this is not for me. Then, was at my mother's house. I don't have a television. Turn on television, episode is on. I was like, let me watch it again. It's like, I don't get this episode. So he has a lot of work. Like, I'm, I'm seeing some sort of genius in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. But it's not specifically for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like some of his songs. And others, I'm like, Ugh. But specifically this video clip, I think Donald Glover is too genius Mm. to address the violence against black people in the way that he did. Okay. Um, So therefore, I'm not super enthusiastic about it. Yeah. I I think he was lazy. Intellectually lazy. Not lazy, but I think he's selling himself short. Okay. Uh, Unless this is really, this is like the height of his capability to produce uh, a work that's focusing on black death. Mm. Um, I thought the scene where um, you have the choir and he's shooting the choir. Mm -hmm. I think that it was largely unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really hurtful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I cannot imagine. Then again, I, I'm not part of his like making process. No. Yeah. Obviously, he should be. Um, but I wonder what was behind that, and how do you? Because it's it's so fresh, and it's, it happens so many times over the years okay. that the black church has got bombed yeah. or something else yeah. happened. So I wonder why you would put yourself in a position because. Often uh, we are not the ones killing ourselves in churches. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like that. That scene just threw me, threw me completely off. Yeah. Um, and I need to see it again. And I reserve my Friday because I think that Fridays are meant for holiness. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different podcast. <laughs> but I, I, I reserve my Friday to really see the video clip a few times and then think about it. Also because I think that he's shooting. A, is it a black man who's sitting and he has yeah. some a good. There are a lot of references. I'm not. I'm, I didn't really catch on to you. Yeah. Mm. I know, but this, no. it's a lot. And I'm not. I'm not such a big super fan of the video. I'm not. No. Mm, no, I don't think so. But then again, maybe like, let me watch it again. Mm. And maybe I come back and say, you know what? Maybe you can do like a Donald Glover unpack. It's probably not. Um, <clears throat> no. No, I won't. Let's do a dirty computer unpack. I actually. I think that would be really nice. Really because Dina Monet is uh, life, basically. Is that right? Is that <laughs> life, right? Life. I love Dina Monet. I think it's also really interesting about how we're seeing all these artists. And I think, like, uh, you as a program maker are kind of a curator, right? Mm. Can I take a bite? I'm eating. I don't know about you. I can talk and eat at the same time. <laughs> Watch out. I will go for all of this. I like, will be watchful. Um... And I like your program, programmer maker. You you curate sort of content. You figure out who's doing what and and so on. And I think that there is definitely something going on in the in the American sort of uh, artistic and mm-hmm. creative psyche. Uh, and I'm curious, um, are there, for the Dutch sort of uh, 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 communities mm-hmm. that you're involved in as a. Um, do you see any of that? Do you re- do you see a kind of um, what do you, what are you? Is there any kind of evolution? Are there issues that we're talking about that we weren't talking? About? Are makers being more political or not? I don't know. What is there? The one thing I'm super happy about um, is that there is a lot of boredom okay. with American art. Okay. Well, as before, you saw that everything that happened in America um, that was the main focus. Yeah. So we can talk. We can talk about Pan Africanism all day until America does something, mm-hmm. and then the lens just shifts. Mm-hmm. And what I'm excited about is people saying like, you know what? I'm not really interested in that anymore. Okay. So the time when the timeline exploded with regards to Donald Glover, mm-hmm. it were mostly my American friends talking about it. Mm-hmm. Whereas for a lot of Black people in Europe that I follow, we saw it and we had opinions, but mm-hmm. other stuff was also happening. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's interesting that there's this rise of focusing on. 
uh, makers from the continent mm-hmm. and makers from the Caribbean. Yeah. And that's what really exciting. Okay. Yeah, that's what really, I think that's more Who's exciting. Popping? Who's popping right now? Um, well, of course. The, the ever so amazing Whiskey. Okay. I'm not sure if he's popping. I just know that I like Whiskey. No. And, um, <laughs> and just, just footage of us going to concerts. Mm. Um, and what was it the other day? Was it Tool Uh I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. Jemmy? Mm-hmm. Who gave us like the looking for my Johnny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me all of them. Every, everybody is continuously <laughs> looking for Johnny. Yeah. Um, but you saw a lot of people putting that on their Instagram stories, on their Twitter. People just enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, so it is basically this movement of saying we are no longer following what's being spoon fed to us. Yeah. Because if you listen to God bless them, Fun X, uh, you're not hearing much of her songs. No. You're not hearing um, many songs, no. so to say. But you see that people are going to the concerts, enjoying the events, mm. and saying, you know, we're not, we're not dependent on mm. what is it you're pushing forward. Mm. So if you look at maybe, for example, the Phonix uh, Music Awards, mm. um, not the most exciting lineup. No? For all, I don't think so, for mm. all of us. Um, women like, um, like Pink Oculus, mm. who's making amazing music, Rotterdam and Amsterdam based, as well as Dental, she is fly. Mm. Um, Sarah Jane, for example. Okay. So all these amazing artists that are really being pushed by mainstream media. Mm. But we love them and we salute them, and I think that's interesting. Okay. I think that social media specifically contributed to um, the broadening of our horizons. That's like, do you do you have to sell as a, uh, do, do, do you have to sell black events and black centered events to to institutions like hard or is it becoming easier to tell them we need to do this here and we need to have this conversation there and we need to or is it is it it's easier to tell an institution I feel we need to do this here because this is important the difficulty becomes when you introduce who you want to have on the panel. Okay. That's the difficulty. So when okay. you say, oh, we need to do a panel, let's say you want to do a panel about, um, about dirty computer. And you have a panel full of black queer people, mm-hmm. or you have a panel full of black queer women. Um, the person will say, oh, but maybe we should mix up the panel. Okay. And my <laughs> mixing up means, let's invite more black people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's invite... Because it's very diverse, exactly. actually. We're not one. <laughs> exactly. But then it becomes like a little bit difficult. Like, oh, maybe it's too black. Mm. Or maybe it is too queer. Or maybe mm. it is too... So you have all these different um, things that you have to take into account. Mm. Because institutes are... They like to have that idea of we're doing something that is, quote-unquote, radical. Mm. But they don't want to alienate the people that... Radical is not controversial or something. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, but we don't want to alienate the people that normally come to our events. Um, mm. So it's, it's part of a project and not so much of the profile of the organization. Mm. Because you know, you know that I was asked to be part of a new project mm. by the Van Abbe Museum. Tell me all about it. Tell me all about it. <laughs> well, it's called Why Am I Here? Which I think is a really great uh, title. And the point is... I'm not sold on it yet. No, you're not sold on no. the title yet. Well, they've invited the three, including me, three uh, trans... Uh, 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 well, three people with a trans experience. Mm-hmm. And two who are artists or thinkers and doers to kind of, in a period of three, four months, yeah. really sort of think through um, what is needed. Like, really, I think it's also kind of a practical question. Mm-hmm. But it's also more of a, like, also like a strategic question like what could we do as a museum mm-hmm. from a museum to be more in co- close inclusive mm-hmm. to quote unquote trans and people and intersex people okay and um, the point is like part of the project involves a kind of an engagement with the existing collection mm-hmm. to go through it think you know sort of think through it and at the end of the of the of the, of the three four months we have like a symposium where the three artists sort of uh, uh, basically report on their findings and their thoughts mm. and so on. And we're, we're tackling it from different angles. Mm. And uh, we have some... some uh, 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 I think the other two are more like um, uh, a building the kunst... How, what is it called? Like more like... Um, oh, visual art? No, yeah, that's sort of performers. Concern. Like yeah. more performance, uh, uh, conceptual performers. Mm. And I'm basically a talker. And, mm-hmm. uh, and a very and good a writer. writer. Oh, yes. stop it. An excellent talker, yes. As, and a writer and so on. So I'm going to be more, I feel like my role in this is to be more um, sort of thinking through, at least what I want to do is I want to think through 
the, 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 the frame, the sort of philosophical, strategic sort of considerations mm -hmm. on like, you know, one of the people I want to invite to talk to is, for example, Miguel, who does a lot of archiving mm -hmm, work, mm -hmm. and amazing. Miguel Perez de Santos, and mm -hmm. ask him about the relationship between archives and, uh, and for example, different traditions of, of creation, for example, mm -hmm. where I come from, oral telling, um, like kept a particular, made sure that what you were telling and what you were transferring mm -hmm. had a certain malleability, had mm -hmm. a certain flexibility, had a certain uh, co-ownership and what happens if you put it in an archive, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what can archives do? And I want to think creatively about like, what can, how can you work and how can you deal with this sort of way more Western way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, relating to, uh, to artifacts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but one, one of the things, I know you've done with Decolonize the Museum, and I really want to sort of, because the project hasn't started yet, I can still get out. I can still be out, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of money, so I hope not. Mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> uh, because luckily I'm getting paid for this thing. Don't say luckily. Rightfully so, Rightfully you're so. getting okay, paid. Okay. Rightfully so, you're but getting paid. But you know paid. they ask also people to come and think through and strategize mm -hmm. and sort of develop without paying them, right? You know yeah, they pay you in lunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've Kai, had quite some experience with uh, Tropo Museum, I believe? Okay, Rijks Museum? Yeah. A little bit, little bit with the Rijks Museum, Tropo Museum, predominantly. Yeah. Predominantly. What are your experiences there? What, what would you tell someone who's about to get into, go into a museum, mm -hmm. look at their collection, and, mm -hmm. and tell them, this is how you can include my people? I love your face. I don't even <laughs> you know who my people is. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say? I don't think the Tau Museum is a good example um, okay. because I feel that the people we work with there, um, first of all, we work with Wayne Modest, who was amazing, Laura mm -hmm. from Ogolf, who was really, really good. And they also did their best to talk to their colleagues when we weren't there. Mm -hmm. um, and you, of course, had some colleagues who were defensive mm -hmm. about everything concerning whiteness and who then later um, changed. Mm -hmm. Who took what we said? Changed. To, they changed. Who they took what we said to heart, um, and still not perfect, but their willingness mm -hmm. to be better. Okay. Um, I think really speaks for them. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's a really, and I've worked with other institutes where it wasn't like this. Okay. Um, and I hope. Mm, let me not speak on Fanapa because I don't know him that well. Um, but I feel that the way we were received in the Trove Museum, even though it was really hard and people, some people made clear how hard it was for them. Mm -hmm. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel that with them, it is a different kind of, um, hmm. it's not as violent okay. as I would imagine it would be and as violent as it could be. Okay. For example, so you're telling me the project is called, why am I here? Mm -hmm. Why is the project called, this is why I'm here? Okay. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm allergic to always asking the question because the question means that we are still part of a dialogue. Mm -hmm. So you tell me, um, you are asked a question like, why am I here? Mm -hmm. You pose the answer, I can still say, like, but a lot of you don't belong. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It still puts you in this position of negotiating something. Yeah. Um, where you have this, I forgot the name of the venue. They had this program and the program was called, uh, can I call you the N-word? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, this is why I cannot call you that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's just, and I feel that with the, the programming that's being done in the museum, and also like a big shout out to uh, Amal al -Ha, who does amazing work there, mm -hmm. um, they are willing to take more risks yeah. um, and put something forward that is also making themselves look bad. Because mm -hmm. you cannot have a project like, you know, people try to do at the Vitri Vit. Where you want to look at everybody else mm -hmm. instead of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure how to find other oper operates with that. Yeah. That's what I don't know. But I well, feel one like of the things that I was thinking of is sort of, when I saw the question, why am I here? Mm -hmm. I was like, in this day and age, I sort of want to turn the question around. Mm -hmm. why, are, why are these museums here? And I think it's an existential yeah. question. So if they're not, I'm not sure what they're, if they're not inclusive... Because to me, I've come to the conclusion that maybe I'm very like, maybe, maybe I'm spinning out of control. Okay. <laughs> Tell me. Sometimes I've come to the conclusion control. if your organization is not inclusive, mm -hmm. if your organization is not decolonized, mm -hmm. your organization is just plain racist. Yeah. 
right? It's just yeah, there's no middle ground. There's no there's no. If you look around and your neighborhood is all white and your school where your kids go is basically all white, mm-hmm. or if you have a few people of color, it's so minimal mm-hmm. and these people are struggling so much to subsist. Mm-hmm. If you're like working at an art institution mm-hmm. where the artists are white, the curators are white, mm-hmm. the board is mm-hmm. white, you know, like. If you're working even in NGOs, yeah. you know, who are like all white, I don't care. You're just working in a racist. You're yeah. having, you're living the ultimate racist life. Yeah. And because it's institutionalized mm-hmm. and a lot of these people go through these lives without sort of a thought, mm-hmm. which is what, what institutionalization is all about is you don't have to think about it. You don't have to active, you don't need to put up signs like, mm-hmm. oh, no black people allowed. Mm-hmm. You're just working in such a way that it just doesn't allow room for people yeah. of color mm-hmm. and so on. And, and so I posit that, you know, these institutions that have this problem, who are racist, mm. are the ones that need to sort of prove their <laughs> existential worth, right? Like Because mm-hmm. if you're a racist organization, should you be here? No. And that's how I see the question, mm-hmm. is why am I here? Is like really, I think, a question of the... That I'm that the from the Abba Museum is asking me to help them answer is why are they there if they're not inclusive if they're sort of mm. just a racist organization yeah does that make sense it does from your perspective yeah. but it also angers me from the perspective of um, black people always having to do the labor of explaining mm-hmm. um, so if if it's true what you're saying and their question is more based on a why am I the Van Appen Museum here? Mm-hmm. No, I think um, the question is to me, but I won't turn that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, I think it's, it's part of doing the work. You cannot mm-hmm. just invite people um, to make you, your organization, feel that they belong or at least should belong. Okay. Yeah, that's what I found. Yeah. But I, I'm glad that you are a part of it. Okay. <laughs> why? Yeah. Uh, because, I, because I trust your, um, I trust your taste. Okay. Uh, I trust your vision. Okay. Um, and I trust you to spin it in a direction that is actually beneficial okay. to us. Yeah. Because I'm very curious because also, specifically, so we're talking about trans identities and mm. intersex identities, and I'm a trans person, mm. but I think that my race is such an integral part of my transness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not sure. Because you talked about, for example, if the panel, if you're, if you're, if you can, it's okay, you can sell them the idea of this mm-hmm. conversation to be had. But they, they, if you sort of put up a panel of like, for only black people, mm-hmm. they will start going like, yeah, but that's not uh, balanced or something. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And um, and I wanna, I find that this question is limited to trans and intersex uh, identities. Mm-hmm. But exactly, it's identities, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's multiple kinds of identities. And the one I can speak to is one that is very much informed of my blackness mm-hmm, and of my, mm-hmm. of my mental health issues and so on and mm-hmm. so on. And, and I wonder um, whether they're ready to like, or did they even have some sort of foresight that it might be a broader sort of conversation that I want to have. That would be amazing if if that's the plan. Yeah, that would be good. I think. That's what I'm gonna do. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, any, yeah, I don't do know it. what else to do. I don't. Know. Do it. Try to do it. Yeah. yeah. But I feel that um, I think that's when you know the intent of the organization. So when you, the intent is to talk about subject X, mm-hmm. but subject X cannot be represented by the people whose lived experience is mm-hmm. actually subject X. Mm-hmm. You know, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's gonna be ridiculous mm-hmm. because then it means that um, there's still room for like. Um, the devil's advocate, or there's still room. So we can talk about you as long as you're not excluding us. Mm. But maybe your conversation should be about excluding me. You know, maybe if I'm part of any oppression that faces you, maybe I shouldn't be part of that panel. Mm. Um, and I feel that like that's not being done often enough. Because I'm okay. like, well, you know, but then it's so good. Now you're doing the same thing. Isn't that reverse? <laughs> no. Is that reverse? It's never. <laughs> it's never what you're calling it. Exactly. Like, no. Yeah. Mm-mm. But I'm looking. When is it? So it's starting basically the 22nd of May, we're having the first kickoff meeting, and oh, nice. then in, in September is the conclusion. Mm. It's when we have the big uh, sort of reveal of what our co- conclusions are. The Van Abba reveal party? I like it. Yeah. The Van Abba one? The reveal party? Like the, when they reveal. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Like, and I'll reveal them, you're racist! <laughs> 
I got front row seats. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because also found that from other the actual sort of the person who uh, whose namesake the universe the museum and who also co- who funded the mm-hmm. museum. Um, they uh, uh, they were a big uh, tobacco tycoon tycoon mm. yeah, in the, in the, in the, the Netherlands, who uh, whose uh, primary sort of their grondstof their um, their the tobacco that they were working with yeah. here in the, in the was coming from plantations in uh, uh, Jakarta and Sumatra yeah. uh, during the colonization period. That was like in the thirties, forties, mm-hmm. uh, I think fifties even. Uh, when when these areas were still colonized, mm. and uh, that's really when I read that I was like, what the hell am I getting myself into? But mm. then I read your piece in One World about sort of these names mm-hmm. that are on streets, on institutions, and uh, and uh, some of the argumentations around it. You want? Can you talk about a little bit on that? Like your. Your your observations. My observation with regards to the Dutch people's need to keep glorifying colonial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the way and the, and the way they they sort of um, uh, justify that, especially the sort of antecedent legality argument, mm-hmm. like sort of like be in that time, mm-hmm. it wasn't uh, illegal. Yeah, I feel that. Um, To include everybody who I want to include. <laughs> like, this sounds like a major drag about yeah, to go. Yeah. <laughs> Mainstream Dutch people, mm-hmm. uh, aka basis. And I'm saying it's mainstream mm-hmm. because I feel that in the Netherlands, racism is connected to. I don't know, look at this. I'm, 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 I'm not going to look at this. I'm not going to look at this. I want to eat it. <laughs> I think um, unless somebody is being actually lynched on Dam Square. Mm. Dutch people argue that it's not really racist. Mm. That, you know, maybe like it's context, maybe it meant something different. They have this cute idea mm. about what racism really is. Mm. So I feel that if you look at uh, the Dutch history, and slavery was abolished in, well, officially 1863, then later 1873, because people uh, were forced to still work after. What happens, let's say 1873, what happens on July 2nd, mm. 1873? Because if you're not changing... If you're not actively trying to change the minds of the people who produced the system in the first place, the fact that you abolish it doesn't mean anything. No. Because you still feel that the other person is inferior to you. Mm-hmm. So maybe you cannot uh, enslave me from a legal, but, but you find enough, you find a different way mm-hmm. to make sure that you never have to answer mm-hmm. to the person that you don't fully consider to be human. Mm-hmm. So if there is a street and the street is in your country mm-hmm. um, glorifying your hero. And somebody who looks like the person you used to enslave and you cannot anymore, but you never unlearned to yeah. think of them as inferior. And that person is now saying, hey, this treat is offensive, this treat is hurtful, for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. You still feel that you are uh, in a position to say, but your opinion matters less. Because mm-hmm. that's basically what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, and to then say, well, I come from a small uh, town north of Amsterdam. And that was a town where young Peter Sankun was born. So in the town square, you have this massive statue of him. It's not super massive, but it's, it, he, he's a monster, so every statue is too massive of him. <laughs> um, and people really glorify his work. And then I cannot imagine, as a person who grew up there, if somebody said, well, you know, we have to take the statue down, mm-hmm. how that would personally affect me. And I know a lot of people who don't really know who he is. Like, mm-hmm. uh, the, I think the square is named on him, or like one of the cafes. But a lot of, I'm sure, a lot of white Dutch people don't know who these people are. No. You would be hard-pressed to walk outside here and go to a person and say, who was Witte de Witt? Yeah. So no, don't give me the street name. Don't give me where the, where the institute is. Who was this person? Yeah. But if you plan to take it down, then everybody's catching feelings. Yeah. Why? Why? Because the person telling you to take it down is somebody you don't consider to be... Um, you don't consider to, them to be a part of the Netherlands. Yeah. You don't consider, to be, you don't consider them to be somebody who can tell you what to do. Yeah. You know, their yeah. voice in history is you, you, you're being used to their voice as being either muted yeah. or being so soft in the background that you don't have to take it into consideration. Yeah. And a lot of Dutch people, uh, they feel like, oh, but they're taking everything away from us. I, how would you know if I take down the sign right now <laughs> and you're not receiving mail in the bit of the bit sign? Mm. How would you know that I've taken down the sign? Yeah. It wouldn't affect you in any way possible. Yeah. I'm from Suriname. If you would come to Suriname and say, well, 
this tweet named as a specific leader from Burundi should be taken down because he or she was a mass mass murderer. Mm -hmm. He or she or they was a mass murderer. Take it down. Yeah. What would I lose? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, but there's also this sort of this sort of um, I think it's really interesting that you say about that shared legacy, right? You're saying these people are saying you are, you cannot make any claim to this legacy. This is our this is our mm -hmm. cultural sort of uh, thing, and you can't speak on it. And also your your experience or your uh, connection to this person yeah. is less important than my connection. Important, yeah, because yeah. I want to celebrate a pirate, and you're fighting for your humanity, so yeah. pirate goes first. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, culture. But I think it's it's, it's interesting how. Um, this sort of ownership and this co-ownership of of a legacy and these names, because I come from Burundi, right? Mm. So we don't have the same sort of like if you're Caribbean or if you're Surinamian and that same visceral but that ownership as well, mm. right? like that that I see and I think is very legitimate mm. to say like, but this is part of our history mm -hmm. as well and we want to talk about how we engage with it, like when is it glorification and so on and when is it not. But one of the things I think is interesting is about how this argument that if you do not, if you take away the signs and the street names and so on, then you're erasing that history, mm -hmm. which is a shared history. And in the context of so much, that especially sort of, there's so much that is being attempted to erase mm -hmm. the violence, to erase mm -hmm. uh, 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 the legacy of slavery uh, uh, and enslavement and and and. And just the workings of it, but also its impact, and you know, there's so much being done already to erase yeah. that. And I, I do worry about. It. I'm like, oh yes, that's actually perhaps if these people do dis disappear, their names disappear, um, and would they disappear? I don't know. What do you? What do you? Think? I don't think so. I think my. Uh, I think the best example people have been giving them, and I'm also I'm co I'm co-signing. There's no Hitler Square no. anywhere to be found. Yeah. Nobody will ever forget who Hitler was, mm. ever. Mm -hmm. So what would, what would happen? Because we're also not learning about Victor Witt now. No. There's not, in my history books, there wasn't a mention of no. Victor Witt. Um, so the fact that there's a street named after him, and nowhere is provided I information... I found out about Victor Witt, at the open letter to Victor Witt, that's when I was like, oh! <laughs> exactly! So, so the idea of when we take down these names, we cannot no longer have these conversations, is false. Mm. Because we've been having conversations about people who we have considered to be monsters. Mm. Like, and so they've taken down, who was it again? Was it like somewhere in the east of the Netherlands, they had this exhibition, and somebody put up um, a statue of, I want to say, Lenin? And then even the right wing homies were like, oh no, that's too much, not Lenin. Mm. Because it's understood that what he did mm. um, was wrong. And I'm putting wrong in quotation marks because wrong now reflects on he did something bad towards. People who are like racialized as white, mm. or at least um, at least not black, of color but white passing, so mm -hmm. to say, um, and that is something that is considered to be bad. Where you could go to Brussels mm. and have the statue of uh, Leopold, let's never call him king because he was he was a monster mm. who killed tens of millions of people in the Congo. No. People say, look, let's look at what he did for the country. Mm. I don't care what he did for the country. He killed millions of black people. No. And it's not as important because he also did other things. And it's Nobody legacy. cares about what Hitler did for infrastructure. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. like, oh, he, did the, he had the Holocaust, but what did he do for the school? Like, yeah. nobody's having that conversation, and rightfully so. Yeah. But when it's about black people or when it's about brown people, it's like, oh, let, let's, let's see. Let's, let, let's, weigh, let's weigh your lives against our benefits. Yeah. I think it was really interesting, this argument about, like, but they didn't know at the time that it was bad. First of all, I don't believe that. Because mm -hmm. that also implies that um, there was never resistance against what they did. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you did something before. So then, if we're having a conversation about um, equal pay, for example, mm -hmm. you had your contract, a contract was made for you back when people believed women should make less money than men. Mm -hmm. are, are we now never going to change that because at the time when your contract was signed, okay. people yeah. didn't know that? They didn't know. Yeah. Because then yeah. you never have to change a law. Yeah. Then you never have to change a law because there was always a moment, you change a law at the moment where people, not so much agree, all of them, mm -hmm. but when people say, oh, this is wrong from now on. Mm -hmm. And then what happens to what happened before? Yeah. So if I now killed you before the murder was illegal, it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. When you know better, so, I want to say when you know better, do better. 
<laughs> I don't want to sound like one of these people, but that's exactly what I mean. But it's also this idea that legality is is morality, right? Yeah, and yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Only those things which are illegal mm-hmm. can we sort of, you know, where people are aware of how illegal or illegal or how immoral or moral they were. Right? And it also means that when it starts being wrong, when the majority of white people in power consider it to be wrong. Because if you had people, <laughs> like, if you had people, if white rep- people say this ain't okay, see? then it's not. Because yeah. I believe, and you know, my friend Joseph Jordan does amazing work on this. You had people resisting and rejecting, and I don't want to even call it like a rebellion, um, but basically rejecting the idea of being enslaved, not the idea, the reality of being enslaved. Mm-hmm. So you had people rejecting from the moment Europeans came and tried to shackle people. Mm-hmm. From that moment, all people were resisting. So when does it when does it start being wrong? Mm-hmm. When white people consider it to be wrong? Mm-hmm. Because what happens to the opinion of the person that says, "I don't want you to rip me apart from my family mm-hmm. and take you somewhere I don't know where you're taking me. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to whip me on a plantation. I think that's wrong. Let me poison your food, mm-hmm. or maybe let me kill myself, or let me do something else." There has been resistance over and over again. So for or working slower. Exactly. Uh, uh, or people cutting their faces yeah. to be like a less attractive person yeah. to buy. Yeah. Things like this. So if this is happening throughout the ages, who, who is anybody to say, well, you know what, but it was considered to be normal back then. Yeah. That's strange. It's normal to who? Yeah. To the it's also, for example, how, uh, also another example is like, uh, uh, right now you have in Pakistan and Bangladesh, Mm. Amazing, amazing women mm-hmm. uh, who who are textile workers who are doing incredible political resistance mm. against mm. the labor conditions that they're working on, the pay, the the, 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 the also the danger of the kind of buildings that they're working in. Mm. They, they, I mean, these women are for for and they some of them are killed, some of them are jailed, mm. some of them are ostracized. They lose their jobs, mm. but they're like become they're starting unions. They're like I mean. There is like a very amazingly politically inspiring, sorry, okay. inspiring uh, 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 resistance mm. against the kind of uh, uh, business model, economic and trade models that we have inf- that we've imp- imposed mm. on these countries, right? Mm. We're shopping at Primark, we're shopping mm. at Hema and I H and M. They, whenever there's a big scandal, someone dies, a whole mm. factory. Falls mm. apart or whatever, or there's some proof of like people being poisoned at their work mm. because they're not using the right blah blah. All of a sudden, everybody asks like, "What is the Hema doing? What is H and M doing? What's the Primark doing?" And then they sort of promise they'll do better, <laughs> uh, and then we really. keep on going. But mm. these these resistance, no one talks about this incredible resistance that people are are and women mostly mm-hmm. of color. Uh, well, yeah, they're of color. They're not, yeah, but anyways, uh, uh, they're fighting. Yeah, they're fighting, and you see, for example, in uh, native native indigenous communities mm. in in Latin America, for example, are fighting to the mm. teeth against, for example, uh, chiquita bananas mm. and uh, against uh, uh, the soya industry mm. and uh, and you know and but they are murdered. Huh? They're yeah. murdered. These actors are being murdered, but we're not seeing that. We're not talking about no. that. But I think that is like um, we are talking about ministers going for trade deals to other countries yeah. and they're yeah. shaking hands and our 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 king. Oh, I hate that shit. Willem, uh, Willem <laughs> uh, who goes oh, down man. to like China and like was like, ooh, I've said something really. Well, his mother did something intense or something like yeah. I, I bet she did. Human rights. Da, da. Uh, I bet she did. I bet she did. <laughs> But that's what we think is center stage and important. Yeah. And, you know, but, but we're th- not... That's how we've been trained to look at things. That's how we've been trained to look at uh, resistance. Um, we're looking at it from the perspective that a person who's doing wrong changes their mind. Mm. That's how it's being presented. Yeah. So we say, oh, uh, the Netherlands abolished... Da, 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 and without ever acknowledging the work that activists did to make sure that this is abolished. Yeah. We present it as, oh, now, now the oppressor thinks it's fine. Let's, mm-hmm. let's celebrate. And I'm laughing because of my... Um, where was I again? I was watching this, this television show about uh, royalties, who I all love. Like, let them know we say, I think every monarchy should be brought down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, every Western monarchy should be brought down. Let me put it like that. And they filmed, the mini film about um, the royal family from the United Kingdom. 
and how one of them, she's not being, I forget her name, but she's not being uh, profiled as much mm -hmm. because she's like an underdog, she's like this true activist, and she's fighting against, um, she's fighting for environmental justice. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, why doesn't ev anybody ever properly capture her on camera? Because she's always like in and out. And mm -hmm. they say, well, because you know, he's fighting the good fight. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you want to catch her, but then she's on her way to the helicopter to go somewhere else. Like, but if you're fighting for environmental justice, why are you in the helicopter? Why are you in the helicopter? Five times a day. I was about to say, what? Helicopter. But she's being heralded as this hero of environmental justice. Yeah. And then you had this other figure who's traveling the world to speak about environment, but he has a private jet. Like, it's like, yeah. like, why are we questioning this? Yeah. We, of course, are. But, like, the media who's heralding him for the work that he's doing, is like, but you're taking a jet every other day. Yeah. But I think it also has to do with the way that we sort of... Uh, uh, there is a way people look up to wealth, yeah. and to people who are rich. Mm -hmm. Like, this one, Abba dude, uh, obviously, was a very, very rich person. He, see, he had, like, a, yeah. a huge collection yeah. of artists and so on. And that's another thing, uh, the whole, like, but he was great for the arts. Type of thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he he his love of art and so on like trend at some point turns into like him starting kind of a museum or donating a lot mm. of money to a museum and so on. They change the name and there's a lot of I think um, this way that people would be like uh, I don't know if it's aspirational people aspire yeah. to the same thing or whether we have you know we've been so sort of taught to think of people who are wealthier as better people mm. that there is a certain uh, there's a certain way that it's like an armor wealth is a kind of armor that sort of mm. like has a way of ricocheting the more like but what you're doing is a base and terrible yeah, and yeah. horrible and yeah, there's yeah. nothing that's gonna make this okay mm -hmm. there, I mean your name should be dragged through the streets instead yeah. of being sort of put on big they were the same yeah. thing I think I personally think also with the whole Jay-Z and Beyonce kind of like uh, I'm sorry I gotta Let's break Let's talk about Jay-Z and Beyonce I'm here for it You know but I'm um, sorry but like how many times are you gonna say that you aspire to become a billionaire I'm not a billionaire am mm. I also worthy mm. you know um, mm. and even can we you better be if you wanna buy these tickets but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but can we also can we also sort of be more critical and think of is it moral to be a billionaire in this mm. day and age mm. and in that time as well was it moral to be that rich? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think it's. Um, uh, Jay but and Beyonce, what to say? Yeah, what to say? <laughs> what to say without some of our friends dragging us? Um, what I don't find inspiring about their their work and this whole like, oh, we should be billionaires, is that you're never striving for a society where everybody's a billionaire. Mm -hmm. Because that, that will take the fun out of being a billionaire, I think. Yeah, exactly. you know I mean? <laughs> so if your exceptionalism is so rooted in capitalism, um, it's not really interesting to me. Is it? Yeah. Right? It's no, not no, to no. me either. They're selling these sort of jackets of theirs for like $450 a pop. What? Like It's interesting how Beyonce had for a very long time uh, a relationship with her dad that sort of made her like, I don't know, super commercial, mm. but like catering to a particular kind of a Christian conservatism mm -hmm. and uh, and then sort of this break we had this sort of sexual awakening but that was also still very much couched in this very like submissive my husband is everything kind of mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. and 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 now we're moving into a very political space with mm -hmm. her and um, so there there is stories about there's a lot there mm -hmm. and and what I what I think we need to do like it would take six hours to sort of unpack and find the human and find the human story because there's so much around. Mm. And I really feel like we're, I don't know who, who she is anymore. Well, I am not, oh, and I, I'm afraid to even say it. Uh, I'm not a super big Beyonce fan. You're not? I'm not. Get out of my house. I know, I'm sorry. Like, let me take all yeah. the food. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a super big Beyonce fan. Um, speaking of food, yes. I, like some of, I like some of her songs. Um, I'm not super impressed or inspired, but what. I feel where there should be a six-hour Beyonce breakdown um, and a breakdown of the work of Janelle Monáe, yeah. a lot of amazing filmmakers. Yeah. There's not a Dutch platform, mm. a, like a commercial platform worthy uh -huh. of us putting in that intellectual labor yeah. of unpacking a Beyonce and doing it on, yeah. on what show would we do it? Mm. No, yeah. Nowhere. Mm -hmm. So as sort of the, this counter movement for... Um, us not returning phone calls. 
when Raggedy shows invite us to talk about stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm here just for the counter movement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, yeah. we're together in this WhatsApp group with other black women in the media. Mm. And, uh, and very activist, very outspoken women. And mm. it's so interesting how there's this general consensus that... Uh, and I think we're radicalizing. I'm gonna say, I'm seeing in this, in, this, in this WhatsApp group, we were very sweet in the beginning. <laughs> no, we weren't. We, we were... were, <laughs> were sweet. We were sweet when we said Happy New Year to each other. That was sweet. Exactly. But, the, I mean, mm. like, I mean... If I, if, I, if I get approached by an organization or media that I don't really trust, this is the group where I'm like, who are these people? And they're like, never mind. Don't pick up. Don't the go phone. there. Move he, on. That person's trash. Yeah, but no. they're asking for other people. No, no. skip that. Yes, yes. <laughs> so this is us saying like we're not available to go to your raggedy show to <laughs> talk about <laughs> not black work. Yeah. Yes. So even though I'm not a Beyonce fan fan, mm. but about that, there. about sort of because I think that also ties into this sort of uh, uh, with with the Vinny David controversy. Mm. One of the things that uh, the writers of the open letter, Mm -hmm. in the very end of the last paragraph, one of the things that they sort of encourage or sort of, they said at some point in the piece, they say like, listen, I think it's important as black people that we need to start thinking about what do, what can we create for one another? Mm -hmm. What kind of platform, what kind of institutions, what kind Mm of, um, uh, 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 in what way can we just create our own things? Yeah, bless you. And, 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 not have sort of like uh, this exploitation of, of black pain, black mm-hmm, thought, mm-hmm, black mm-hmm. creativity, black output. Mm-hmm. And yes, this Van Abbe Museum is asking me to make them more inclusive. But what's, how do you feel about just doing our own things? I think we can do both. You can do both? I think we can do both for sure. Um, and you have some people who never want to work with institutions, bless them. You have some people who trash institutions the whole day and still work with them, bless them. Mm-hmm. Um, and also because, you know, bills need to be paid. Mm. And we can, we can be super romantic about this uh, and act like that's not what... But that's also what's happening. Mm. People have re- the most ridiculous day jobs to pay their mortgages, yeah. to pay their rent. So I think it's fine to say, look, oh, I'm working with this institution. As long as that work um, isn't draining you. Mm. So never let an institution drain you to the point that you cannot do what you're, what you're here to do, basically. Yeah. What do you, how do you decide what you're going to do for the culture with the people and what you will sort of do um, outside? Because you've worked with all kinds of institutions mm. and organizations uh, and you've advised them. Mm. Uh, but you've also, for example, Concrete Blossoms in Rotterdam and uh, you work with Balmo Park Theater, mm. which are more also like more black spaces. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Um, for example, you say, Bechera, we need to like discuss. Amongst ourselves. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so wh- where do you sort of, wh- what is, how do you decide what you will do with a sort of like more mainstream, of one, main, yeah, mainstream? I think a mainstream, sorry. Or what will you do with, for black platform, black spaces, black... Uh, I think a mainstream institute, um, I can organize a mainstream panel. Mm-hmm. Blackity black, of course. Okay. But <laughs> about a mainstream topic. Okay. Um, but if it's a, 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 a platform or an institution that never really paid attention to subject X, for example, and now they want to do something that's super radical, mm. I'm cautious. Okay. Because what would make you want to pay attention to this? Mm-hmm. Um, and how are you going to? You have it often when you write a text for promotional meetings, and they change the text. Mm. And they change in a way. It's not, it's not a super radical change, so you have to read it a few times. You're mm. like, oh, but this is not what I said at all. Yeah. Um, and for me, that's not worth it. Because then you're giving me extra headaches. Um, and I'm also not sure what you're going to do afterwards. So, for example, the Bali. Um, <laughs> boycott the Bali already. The Bali People forever. just need to boycott Listen, the Bali. Bali okay. is trash. And they, mm. they can organize a Black Lives Matters event with queer women. It's amazing on a Monday. Then on the Wednesday, they will say, so let's talk about the Muslim problem. Yeah, the Muslim in problem. The, in this same breath. Yeah. And I would never want to organize an event at a venue that the day after, or maybe it's even the month after, mm-hmm. they would organize something like this. Yeah. And if you don't know, then you don't know. But mm-hmm. these event, the, these kind of institutions, and specifically something like the Bali, they continue to do it. Okay. So now, for example, we have with Rivet, and they, they responded to, um, I'm not sure if, if, I, if, I can, if I can mention his name, but they responded to one of the initiators of the letter the way that they did, violently okay. and hurtful. Hmm. So to then organize something in their building afterwards, I wouldn't do it. 
Mm. Doesn't matter how much they would pay. And I'm not saying this to be the toughest kid on the block, but it really wouldn't matter how much they would pay. Yeah. Because I feel out of solidarity, mm. you should have said no. Yeah. And if something like, I don't know, if maybe if the entire staff of the Bali changes, um, because I'm sure that you have, like, you know, not all Bali employees. Um, <laughs> but your director is trash. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as that person doesn't change, he, he comes online on, on Twitter talking the most violent things. Okay. So then, are we now going to do what? Are we going to discuss Beychella at the Bali? Yeah, no. Never. Because I think that's interesting. What you say about people quitting, like, just leave. Yeah. Just go. Just go. Go do something else with your life. Exactly. About that. <laughs> I know I'm clapping, but I can still going to be good. Yes. <laughs> we had yet another incident of... Tell me. Huh? Tell me. We had yet another incident a couple of days ago yeah, yeah. of some white dude who <laughs> thought it was entirely okay uh, in the spur of the moment mm-hmm. to just like... Talk shit out of his mouth, but literally just blurt out whatever is on his mind, which is that I don't uh, believe that he blurted it out. Because when you blur something out, I think I believe that this is. It was for comic comic relief. It was it was it was a joke. It was a well placed joke in the sense that everybody in the room started laughing. This is someone who probably says that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I imagine him sort of cutting people, his clients' hair. And making those kind of mm-hmm. comments like, well, I'm preventing you from looking like... Uh, I'm going to go on and repeat the word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways. And, 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 and what do they do? Everybody gets pissed off. And what it is they do? He sends in this very strange apology. It doesn't feel like an apology. Saying, yeah, yeah. He says, like, I'm sorry if I made you feel bad. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I never meant to. Obviously, yeah. this is sort of the thing, right? Mm-hmm. No one ever means it. They do. Unless you, unless you confront them with it. And I think that is... The cowardice of it is something that's typically Dutch. Because mm-hmm. I don't mind a racist. Yeah. But I mind a cowardly racist. Yeah. <laughs> a cowardly racist! I like that! I don't like that. Like, Hashtag cowardly, <laughs> cowardly racist. racist. <laughs> like, because you know what you said. Yeah. And you don't care. Yeah. Because the level of the comment is so hurtful that you don't care. Yeah. And maybe you say something to somebody and the person says, oh, I wasn't aware that this is hurtful to you or something yeah. like that. You said this with such venom in your yeah. voice yeah. that I don't believe that. How, how, was it, how was it meant otherwise? Yeah. How was it meant? How could you possibly mean exactly. that also, in any like, oh, but I like black people. Like, exactly. what? You literally despise you really, us. Yeah. <laughs> you, you think we are the most hideous creatures on earth and yeah. you pray, you hope that everybody prays Late at night, that they will never wake up looking like us. Exactly. That's what you said. That's what you said. Yeah. About this boring white girl. But this is this is what I think is interesting because that's that's that very overt kind of racism. Yeah. And, but the Dutch are specialized in the sort of. Oh, like, they're masters. They're masters of this thing that invisibilize racism. This yeah. thing that you don't mm-hmm. see that leads to the fact that their whole their schools will be all white, their neighborhood will be all their mm-hmm. organizations that work in mm-hmm. So. I don't want to be like, fire the ones that are like overtly racist, but I also want to think about the people who work at these organizations that are, that are racist, yeah. but like all of a sudden decide that they're different mm-hmm. and that they want things to be different because mm-hmm. they're all well-meaning. Mm-hmm. I find myself having to, I find myself thinking, but you should quit. Or get fired. Or get fired. Yeah. Be, and make up a room for someone yeah. who doesn't revel and live and sort of uh, 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 um, didn't see this mm-hmm. racism that they live in. Like, mm-hmm. how are you going to tell... I'm sorry, but I find it difficult for these academia, for example, mm-hmm. for these, all these institutions to come out and say, we want to be more inclusive. Mm-hmm. Tell us how. But we're all going to keep our jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Excuse me. If you were not inclusive last week or last year... Or the four years of your career and your education and your neighborhood and where you work, mm-hmm. you're. Why would I mean? How this guy is also going? I was. I didn't mean it that way. He won't lose his job. He won't get fired. No. He won't. Like there's just no consequences to racism. No. But also that sort of subtle racism. Like I do not believe this whole slew of people I see in the academia now being all like we're all pro diversity, mm-hmm. pro inclusivity, but know. they all keep their jobs. Yes. How does this people, work? People don't want to be less racist. They want to be more relevant. That's the thing. 
What did you repeat that again? Could you just repeat that? For everything. They don't want to be less racist. They want to be more relevant. They want to be more relevant. And they don't want to give up their position in doing so. So this guy um, who said who made the, the, the comment about this woman's hair, and her hair was boring, by the way, mm-hmm. um, made this comment about her hair. If you are truly remorseful, because I do believe in saying things, and you're not aware that this is her fault, <laughs> not not the word that he said. But let's say you say something, and someone says, "Well, you know, the word you're using to refer to me is is painful." Mm. Your initial reaction would be, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I would never." And you come back. You see, and you see this with. Um, uh, his other cousin, Eva Hooker. When Eva Hooker was talking about style, and she referred to uh, Rihanna as the N-word combined with the B-word, mm. her initial reaction was to mock the people who confronted her with yeah. her. She was mocking, pushing back. Then when the, you had this whole media like storm over her, mm. then she said, I'm sorry, this is not what I meant. I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean, but what you're sorry about is that mm. people are confronting you yeah. with it now. And you're sorry for yourself, basically. Yeah. And this is, again, the hierarchy of humanity. Because now we have to focus on you feeling bad. Mm-hmm. And that's something he didn't put in his, like, I'm so sorry speech. But often you say, people say, oh, I'm, I feel so bad now. Mm-hmm. And I see it when working with um, illegalized refugees. You have a lot of people that say, oh, you know, I'm their supporter, and I'm their buddy, and we're going to do stuff. They make the most horrendous jokes mm-hmm. about black people. And uh, our mutual friend... We often confronted them with that. And then I remember this one incident when somebody made a horrific joke about uh, a brother from, uh, I think it was from Ivory Coast. And now I want to know who this mutual friend is. You know, the, the mutual friend who we met through. Yeah. And then somebody made this hor- horrific statement about uh, um, corruption and the specific country where the person was from. And I confronted him, but it was this email group. Mm-hmm. So I came in like 10 replies later. I said, yeah. oh, hold up, I think you said I was racist. <laughs> oh. And then she pushed back and saying, first of all, I was overreacting, I was always being difficult, da, 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 da. and then more people, our friend came in, different people came in, and then she sent me a letter, first of all, general tip for your life, if you talk smack in a group email, never send a mm-hmm. private email, <laughs> you gotta keep it in a group email. <laughs> and then, so she just said, well, you know, I, and now... Because I don't know you like that. I don't know you like that. I so don't know you like that. back. We're adding everybody again to the group. <laughs> and then she said, um, um, well, if it makes you feel better, now I also feel bad. And I said, well, you know, maybe it made me feel better if I cared anything about how you feel. How you feel. That was but the I point. Don't, so it's, yeah. it's not affecting my day. Mm-hmm. But now you want to talk about how it's making you feel. Yeah. And I feel that in all these apologies, there's this element of, but also feel sorry for me. Yeah. So even though I came for your entire humanity, yeah. feel sorry for me. Yeah. But there's a thing about, about that I, I didn't mean it like that. I think the whole I didn't mm-hmm. mean it like that apology says not so much about what you said, mm-hmm. but about how other people heard it. It literally puts the blame yeah. on the persons that you yeah. have insulted yeah, yeah, yeah. and denigrated, right? Yeah. And I think that's such an interesting mechanism to be like, oh, I didn't mean like that. It means that we are either overreacting yeah. Yeah. Uh, or we don't, uh, we're, we're, we're genuinely just sort of uh, suspicious people who don't, uh, who are not willing to really hear you out. There is this element of like, um, like, you know, I have, I am, I am a good person, I mean well, mm. if you only cared to see mm. that. Mm. And I think that that's such a, that's such a sort of, like, putting the onus on someone else that you've yeah. hurt, mm-hmm. and saying, in a way, like, if I'm still angry, mm-hmm. if I'm still going, like, excuse me, you need to get fired, mm-hmm. then I just don't, I'm not, I'm not willing enough mm-hmm. To like take that into consideration yeah. and find out what you did mean or something. I agree, but I also want to take it. That's why I hate that. the I didn't mean it like yes. that apology. That wasn't my intention of apology. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It just basically says I'm overreacting. Or if I'm not, if that's not good enough for me, then you know I'm the one that's being mean. But it also says something about um, again bringing back to to Dutch people and in all their mainstreamness and how they deal with um, racism and colonial ideas. Mm. Saying I don't mean it like that is saying. I don't mean to dehumanize you. No. Well, the word that you said is dehumanizing. No. So, but, but you're still in this frame of saying, I can call you the N-word, and I don't think it's dehumanizing. Mm-hmm. So it's normal for you. Yep. It's normal for you to basically call me a monkey mm-hmm. and say, but, oh, but I didn't mean it to dehumanize you. No. I just think that you look like a monkey. No. No. But, but that's what he said. No. So for you to then say, like, oh, I don't think there's a vegan variant to that. Which so, calls yeah. then a vegan variant, uh, yeah. sort of anti-species, they would go like, 
And you know there's nothing wrong with monkeys. See? Exactly. So, <laughs> and, and, and you look so good for a monkey. Yeah. You know what I mean? so this, this, whole, but this whole idea of saying, it, it, it's basically feeding into this idea of before, this wasn't bad. Mm. So this idea of, oh, before, nobody protested against it. Mm. So it was a normal word. Mm. And now you are making this a bad word, but I didn't mean it like you think it means. Mm-hmm. But this is what it means. This is exactly what it means. No. Dude is trash, and we should still come for him. I mean, we should. We should still come for him. <laughs> I'm never letting go of Eva Hooker. I don't never. care. Never. No. Eva Hooker all the way. No, I don't care. I don't care. Because, it's, because she is such an example of how um, white, uh, the mainstream white women in fashion think about black women. Yeah. And there's nothing about the way that she reacted that would make me think, oh, let's forget about that incident. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's, it's an example of what happens. Mm-hmm. Was, didn't even Rihanna respond to it also? Yeah. And then no, Rihanna, Rihanna was like, she was like outraged. Cause she, she, Rihanna deserves a proper breakdown, yes. Yeah. She's amazing. She does deserve a breakdown. <laughs> <doesn't> <laughs> I tr- I, there's something that happened on, on my face, Facebook that made me want to leave Facebook. Oh, tell me. And but no, I'm not even gonna say it. It just does not deserve airtime. Oh sort of, snap! Let me just put it this way: gay boys sometimes mm-hmm. such a disappointment. <laughs> Cis gay boys mostly. Mm-hmm. But anyway, we'll talk about that another time. Oh, what I want to talk to you about is you mentioned um, sort of like the 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 the, 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 uh, the we are here community. Well, the sort of undocumented. Uh, the activism around undocumented people mm. and illegalized migrants, and uh, and you mentioned a little bit of dynamics between uh, some of the people that are somehow like supporting and are involved, mm. and 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 racism, mm-hmm. and uh, I think you're one of. The, I remember you were tweeting also live tweeting about a ca- the, the recent case, mm-hmm. um, uh, surra- with regards to the. Uh, to the squatting axi- yeah. uh, action in, uh, in the Amsterdam for mm. We Are Here, and you were t- live tweeting and you mentioned sort of disruptive nature of some of the white uh, supporters mm. and sort of like really sort of, but also that no one had taken care to think of translating mm. to, uh, to Dutch, or to French or to English or to Arabic mm. for the people, for the migrants themselves concerned who mm. couldn't actually follow what was mm. going on, right? And, and I wanted to ask you about sort of like how well maybe not how but maybe just tell us about what are the so what do you, what do you see happening and how does this work this sort of um this sort of um, white saviorism i guess mm-hmm. you know how are we seeing that play down with this with this community with this particular issue in this day and age well i don't want to make this is it a lot is it oh it's a lot it's a lot it's a lot yeah yeah and i do want to make a distinction between the we are here group um in particular, and illegalized migrants in general, mm-hmm. because they don't represent the entire community. No. Because it's a group of, I think, maybe 200 yeah. people, and you have thousands yeah. illegalized people, maybe even in Amsterdam alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel that there is not enough media attention brought to, like, why are there tens of thousands? Even. Exactly. Um, but when we talk about, we talk about We Are Here, which is a group of 200 people who deserve everything they're fighting for. Um, but I need to have these other thousands of people included in that narrative as mm. well. And people understanding that, oh, not every illegalized refugee has a squatted building to go to. Mm. Not every illegalized refugee mm. has a ton of supporters behind them to open their case. And mm. I think that's really important because the current narrative is now that, oh, all illegalized people are part of We Are Here, and that's not, no, that's not really the true. case. Yeah. Um, with regards to the saviorism, I haven't seen, and I would really love to see, a collective run by illegalized refugees mm. or by people who are formerly illegalized refugees and who now have their residence yeah. I'm just suspicious of every movement that is headed by people who it doesn't concern. Mm. So whenever you talk about a collective of illegalized refugees and it is basically headed, the political agenda is um, driven or at least like dictated by a majority of white supporters who have never lived the reality that a lot mm. of these people are facing, I'm cautious. Yeah. Because it also means that, and uh, so our friend had it, uh, my other good friend, Natifa El, showed, we, had, we faced it numerous times where you could not, in their company, discuss racism. Yeah. 
because why are you discussing this? And, I, and I'm doing good. Yeah. I'm saving all these poor Africans yeah. so I can crack an Africa joke. Yeah. We were like, ah, this is racist, this is racist, don't say that. And they were like, but what? And one of them literally said, I said, look, you have a half an Africa joke left before I'm knocking the teeth out of you. <laughs> like, I just, like, just, like, like, you're, you're just, just, you're just close. close. Don't and, push it. No, and, then, and then she literally said, at the end of the day, it's such threshold work. We also deserve some relief. At the, at the have, expense? I have, I have it in my inbox still. And I was like, but take into account what you're saying right now. So you're basically coming here. And I asked many of them, like, what would she do if tomorrow morning I would open a suitcase full of wrestling experiments for this specific group of people? What would you do the day after? Yeah. Nothing. Because this is your entire life. Yeah. You need this moment of entering a space be it a squatted building or a different shelter, of coming in and seeing 30, 40, 50 people who constantly say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Can you help us with this? You need this. Yeah. So if tomorrow morning, even though you complain about it continuously, why don't they ever clean? Why don't they ever do this? If tomorrow morning they would wake up and do everything themselves, yeah. you wouldn't know what to do with yourselves. Yeah. Because you constructed your life around this idea of somebody needing you. Yeah. And you feeling better. So this is like the new volunteerism. So now you don't have to travel to Rwanda. You, to you can just take a tram somewhere else and be, you know, saving people. Yeah. And it's horrific. The, the racism is on. So you have the jokes about people's countries. You have the prejudice, of course. People saying um, just the idea of being around black people and what this means for people who are never around black people, so to say. Mm. But also the idea of if you are... Um, just not taking into account what is, what is important to us. Mm. So, for example, I remember, um, I think maybe, no, it was maybe two years ago, somebody in a shelter I often visited, <clears throat> somebody passed away. And he passed away um, in, in, a, in a very brutal way. Let me just say that he, he wasn't dead immediately. Mm. So then you have this moment of saying, at least like in the culture where I'm from, I'm sorry, anyways, um, when you say, what are we doing because we know this person will never wake up again. Mm -hmm. So are we now, like you, it's not just for black people, but you do, you do your, you prepare to do your rituals, so mm -hmm. to say. Like, let me keep it like, uh, you prepare to do your rituals. And then one of them made the call, so then the doctor comes in and says, well, this person's not gonna make it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's for, like their sense of ethics, we are not keeping a person alive if there's no prospect of the person recovering. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're letting you know that like, this is gonna happen and mm -hmm. maybe you wanna call somebody else. Then somebody said, um, so we informed the doctor that they can pull the plug. Mm -hmm. I said, but oh, but did you call the imam? Mm -hmm. yeah. And they said, see, Simone, this is why you're dope, because you always think about this. I said, so, but, but hold up. So you told the doctor to pull the plug, but you didn't call somebody to pray for this man mm -hmm. who's laying there. This is why... Actually, my heart just froze see? for a second there. <laughs> but things like this. Wow. But things like this. Or just saying, like, oh, we have... Um, because I think, like, working with um, this specific group, you see a lot of death also. Mm. Just idea, like, how do you deal with death outside of your culture? Mm -hmm. And maybe humbling yourself. Yeah. So maybe when you're saying, and the most of the people who I work with are, are Muslims. Mm -hmm. So you have, and not, not all Muslims have the same, the same customs, but for this specific country, they had the customs of how do you, what do you do when you're close to the grave? Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, you know, it doesn't really matter because I also know this person, I'm just going to stand in front. But if you're looking at the crowd, mm -hmm. nobody who looks like you is standing in front. No. Stand back. Stand back. Like, yeah, but I also knew him, and I have flowers. Mm. F your flowers. Go back. Uh, they don't care. So it's this idea of, I'm doing good, so therefore, I, I'm having I'm these liberties. I'm having entitled. these liberties. Yeah. The way people address them, it's horrific. People are yelling. Hey, yeah, but you have to be clear with them. What is them? You're treating this as if this is a daycare center yeah. and somebody smeared peanut butter all over the way. Yeah. You talk to a human being like you're addressing a human being. Yeah. Especially also people who are traumatized, but like exactly. intensely traumatized. Exactly. Not only from the countries that they come from or the kind of uh, political oppression they might have gone through or the poverty, which mm -hmm. I think is a form of political oppression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the travel, the, the journey to here is extremely traumatic. Yeah. And then the INDA, how the INDA treats people yeah. 
the, as it says, some yeah. of them might have ended up in detentions. Exactly. Just so trauma upon trauma upon trauma, and you commit to that, and all you're going to sit there and be like, but they don't clean. They don't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> these people, it's just, I don't know. I've seen, I've seen some of these interactions as well. And, uh, and, uh, and I do not have, I found myself far, that I did not have the, the stamina to mm. also manage the people, the white people trying to be supportive. Mm -hmm. I was, I just can't, I can't, you know, so I would, anyways, but there's one other thing I want to talk to you mm. about. And, and, and I think this goes to the heart of where, why I'm sort of finding it really difficult. Like I had on my bio, and I still have on my bio, Twitter bio, feminist. Mm. I think it's something like intersectional feminist or mm. something. But I'm, I'm having a hard time. Mm. I'm having more and more of a hard time calling myself a feminist because uh, not for the ideology, but the community. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, for example, that I'm not hearing enough or even at all about mm. is when we talk about women, mm -hmm. And we're not talking about how uh, 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 undocumented and illegalized migrants, mm -hmm. how the women, mm -hmm. the atrocities that they're going, the sexual violence they're going, so violence that is specifically sort of like that they only get because they are women, mm -hmm. uh, trans or otherwise, mm -hmm. in detention centers, in as it says, by the E and D. Mm -hmm. um, in, in neighborhoods, when they move, when they do they do get papers and they have to move into neighborhoods and so on, mm -hmm. the fact that whatever feminist agenda we have that we might say in the Netherlands we have, it doesn't at all talk about the very specific. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've talked about the gay people, gay migrants, how they're faring and and uh, and and how many difficulties they're having and as it says and whatnot. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the, how the end day is, uh, but. Treating them, we've talked about undocumented men, mostly mm -hmm, we are mm -hmm. here, but we're hearing nothing. I mean, literally mm -hmm. nothing mm -hmm. about women. And my heart breaks for that. Yeah. And it makes me feel like anyone right now in the Netherlands that is calling themselves a feminist, mm -hmm. like, needs to take a step back. Anyways, in my, near me. I think so, yeah. And, you know, because I do not understand how we can say we're feminists mm -hmm. and talk about pay gap. Seriously talk about pay gap. Mm -hmm. When we're not talking at all. Like in, in, in England, they did, they did this research in detention centers. Mm. And they found that uh, the vast majority of the women were able to recount instances of, of sexualized violence mm. and intimidation by guards mm. and by other uh, people in the detention centers. Mm. It was a massive, massive scandal mm. in England. Mm. No one has bothered to go ask women in detention centers in the Netherlands. But we know there are abuses yeah, there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that, for example, Calais in the jungle, mm. uh, we know that the first victims, these are researches that are done internationally, the first victims of sexualized violence of, uh, uh, of, of are, are children and women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when they're displaced, when they're moving or traveling towards every account that we've heard from like the, the, in Libya and mm -hmm. in Italy, there is rape, there is, you know, there's all of that. Mm -hmm. But it is not on the agenda. No. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling, I'm the same with regard, if you saw I'm a feminist, I'm like, I don't know what that means anymore. Yeah. Um, and I'm not co-signing what people have made it seem that it means. Mm. I'm like, no, that's I feel you, yeah, mm. for sure. But there is there is a, a, a vagine here, mm -hmm. and there is uh, there's a collective of women. No, I don't know their name. They have also named a, a collective. A collective of refugee women. Women, yeah. Mm -hmm. In Amsterdam. I don't know. Um, I don't really know, and because of like the the, the troubling experience I had with. Large collectives um, that are headed by uh, Savior supporters. Mm -hmm. I try to stay away from the collectives okay. a little bit more, and basically say, if you know somebody who needs yeah, this and let this, me this know. let me know. <laughs> and help us out that yeah. kind of way. But so the big, I know you have a collective close here. It's in the Pauluskerk, um, yeah. like a few streets behind here, I think. They, had, it's it's a big church, and there they have a few people also living and coming during the day. I'm not sure how that works. Maybe. Yeah. I think there are also women in that collective. Yeah. And there, I know there's a, in Amsterdam, there's also a collective of women. But yeah, so that's a bit my... Uh, 
my yeah, uh, I hear you. But it's also uh, and and whenever people work, um, from many team when I work with the women, they have such narrow ideas of what a woman should do, mm. women in trans women should do to make a means. Mm. So it's often, um, you know, if they want to do something fun with them, they're going to have like a hair day. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, maybe somebody wants to have a check day. I don't know what it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe somebody wants to like, do something else. Like emerging out, yeah, game, there's something. nothing else. But this, this or one, soccer. I don't know. Like, do something I had else. a lot of like cousins and sisters in Burundi who played soccer like their life depended on See, that's what <laughs> yeah. I mean. Yeah. What is the narrow idea of, oh, let's do this with, but, mm. you know, do women. And maybe, yeah. Um, but th- yeah, there's not, there's not enough attention going to um, first of all the trauma, but also when people are uh, when women are circumcised. Yeah. So you have a lot of women. So sexual the sexual violence in some of the horrific cases often leads them to a pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Um, and what happens if you know there's there's a lot of shame on women who are seen in a specific kind of way and who are then pregnant mm-hmm. and there is you know they don't have a husband so yeah. to say. And you're getting mocked right. by the staff of the, the asset say. Oh, yeah. Because why are you wearing the hijab? So where's your man? Yeah. Are you hanging around with yeah. your hijab? And you're like, what? wait, hold up. Are, are we having this yeah. conversation? Exactly. Um, but that's what they're facing. And also, I remember this one woman, she was pregnant, and um, I offered. So listen, I'm not squeamish, but delivery? Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody else can help you with that. <laughs> it's like, I uh, help you a lot, but with like, a baby coming out, out of, of you, it, I, don't know. Like, I can't deal. I don't know if I can. Uh, because <sighs> but she was like surrounded by baby, so I said, you know what? Whenever you feel um, the contractions, you let me know, if, and then I continue to the hospital. And then um, my mother, who's like this amazing, amazing person, she said, um, please make sure if the woman is circumcised, because if she is, and maybe she's afraid to tell you, and when she's giving birth, that could mean like complications with mm. the baby okay, okay so uh, i was talking about like how are we, how are we asking this and i remember having this conversation with my friend a black woman and then the savior comes in and she said you should just ask if she's circumcised i said oh may- maybe not you know mm-hmm. may- maybe, maybe not open the door and have yeah. that and then, hey 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 yeah listen on, hey a uh, quick question yeah. uh, <laughs> but just this idea of you have no privacy yeah. You have no, you, there's nothing that is part of who you are. No. Um, you can hold nothing back because somebody's yelling the question, and uh, and organizations are not very discreet. So the moment you say, "Oh, I'm a, I'm a buddy of this and that person," they send you complete files of the person. No. <laughs> they do. I have a, somebody sent me a file of somebody, and I said, "Oh, I am, I've been with this person to your office maybe twice." <laughs> to give them a right, but I'm not their contact person. Yet you send me entire files of their home medical. Are you system. kidding me? No, no, no. Yeah. But this is not legal. No. But this is the thing. So if you create a group that is, um, if you can make it believable, uh-huh. and if you're, if you sound Dutch mm-hmm. on the telephone, they give you information. And you're like, but this is a person. Oh my god, this is. And this is not me saying, oh, I'm, you know, I'm sending. I want to send an email to clients and I accidentally send it to you. This is, this is something completely different. Just the privacy level of people who are like at the outskirts of marginalization yeah. is zero yeah. to none. But this is extremely shocking because you cannot, you cannot uh, legally send around people's medical information. Uh, it, there's, like, there's like legal sort of protection there that makes sure that, for example, you... you uh, for example, I have like an extensive file at uh, mm. at uh, at, uh, at the psychiatric clinic mm. that I'm in. If anyone wants to have access to it, I have to give permission. Not all. And I, I have I to know you. for what, and I have to know what exactly they want to know. Not if you're like a, you know, there are protections. If I would call now, not 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 knocking your the institution that you were in because I'm not sure. But if I would call and say, look, um, I'm part of this collective, and we're you know we're supporting refugees. I'm super worried about Olaf. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen Olafa in the building for such a long time. All her friends are worried. You know, can we? Can you maybe get some information? If yeah. you just talk to Olafa, like she would tell you it's fine. Yeah. And please, okay, like hold me, uh, let me hold up. So uh, you're looking for the medication of Olafa? Wow. I've had that. Wow, that's really. It's yeah. Because they feel like oh, it's you know, you are you are from here, so you must mean well. Yeah. Like, but then everybody can call. And these people also. 
I have no agency, so there's no, no need to check with them. There's no mm. need to explain to them that it would they would be waiving a mm. protection like privacy protection rights. No. <sighs> I remember being in this email group of people discussing somebody's mental health and people having all kinds of diagnoses. Really? Like, I think well, I think the person is having a psychosis. Like maybe maybe talk, maybe tone it down, but like yeah. the like the kitchen table analysis. Yeah. Because um, because how how would you know? Like none of us here are fit to make that diagnosis. Yeah. But then the person who was calling, maybe the police or something happened, says, okay, well, the person's having a psychosis, so maybe you can... Yeah, precisely. And then you are, you know, you're, you're labeled. And we know what happens with black people. Exactly. With, considered as for art. Exactly. Oh, my God. Listen, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, I asked you to bring something to read, and then we can, we can close this off and then eat. And finish. I'm almost done. Yeah, maybe this one left. And I'm going to How do you have this? Oh, this is yours. Okay, sorry. Yeah, because like, it's, it's actually, it's like, it's, uh, I did everything in one half. Yeah. Read for us. I'm just keeping my eye on you. Read for us. I, before you read, I just want to thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for inviting me. It I'm is so beyond fun. everything I expected. It. It's so, thank so, so everything. Thank, thank you for inviting me. I love you. Uh, mm. I might have to invite you after the end of the fun of the project and I think like, you should. Listen. <laughs> listen, this thing listen, you talked about. Listen. Why didn't you warn me? Oh, we have to burn some stuff down. We have to burn some stuff. I was thought it would be really interesting that if I, I was thinking, eh? mm. wouldn't it be really cool if I did sort of like a, at the end of this whole journey, mm. did a performance and just sort of have all these white people come to this thing mm. and then get a really big sheet, really big, like a lacquer, like mm. a big. And then walk to the logo of the damn thing and just <laughs> that would be amazing. Put it over it and be like be amazing. Whew, we're done with you. Don't we're need done. a name. You don't need a name. You just skip the fuck yeah. shit. Just you call me your museum, but then we might talk. You should do it. Have them <laughs> go up there. Put it in your van. Let it be a black sheet though. Black sheet, yes. Be a black sheet. <laughs> okay, read for us. Okay, read well, let me find something. So I wanted to read something else, and I was like, oh, no, no, let me read this. Mm -hmm. As we demand attention for how racistly violent the Dutch police is, let us also talk about how Royal Marie-Jose and security guards at the asylum detention centers assault illegalized refugees. Let us talk about the violence they use to control people. Let us talk about the choking and the things they put over people's mouths and their faces. While doing so, let us not be fooled by official statements about what is and isn't allowed anymore. What does not being allowed mean... To some people who know that they won't be checked, let alone punished for misconduct. Absolutely nothing. What's make, what makes this extra problematic is the fact that the consequence of their behavior stretch far beyond their terrain. Their terror they inflict themselves and the hyper-violent rampages they trigger in the countries of origin of the people they deport. Mm -hmm. So this is my, it's, it's a longer piece, but this is my kind request and firm demand that in all our agendas with regards to violence against uh, black and brown people to not forget illegal refugees yeah. because once you're in an asylum detention center you're facing all kind of terror yeah. that's not being documented and sometimes you don't want to talk about it when, once you're out because it's too traumatic for you yeah. um, and so there's no recourse there's no legal recourse no. to actually if there are instances of that violence like you said like mm. it, you, they say it's not allowed anymore but what does that who, mean? Who can check them? And I've okay. heard, uh, unfortunately, horrific, horrific stories uh, of people who were brutalized in asylum mm -hmm. detention and who faced them. Um, and we're doing... We're also solitary confinement. Is solitary a big thing. Yeah. That is... Uh, it's, and there's a report where they say that, that is, uh, there's this concrete link between solitary confinement and um, your mental health. Mm -hmm. And how it decreases every time you have to be put in there for like sometimes like months on end. Mm. Um, even though they say, oh, it's only for two days. Um, well, you're not. I think. I think the uh, the World Health Organization, or something a big international organization has, or the UN, has ruled solitary confinement beyond something like two weeks or something, as officially as torture. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, tell that to the people in Schiphol we'll and, do, yeah. to, and and in yeah. uh, Rotterdam Airport. Yeah. Thank so, you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. <laughs> oh my god, how amazing! Thank you, okay, so I was thinking we needed to like sort of cut it to an hour, but I don't want to. We can. I want every minute.